I don't know if I can tell your story properly. This is, this is a painting that your dad did. Okay, your father painted this painting, and this is a real place. And um, there's some anniversaries involved. That's the part I was stumbling on. I don't know. So 40 years later, they went back to look at the place that he painted, and the tree is still there. It's still twisted. It still has a big hole in it. Twice as tall, and if you, you can tell, it's half missing leaves on this one, but it's filled completely. So it's not just survived, but thrived. So that's that's great. <laughs> yep. Yep. There you go. If the tree can survive, I can survive. And you see some amazing things out there. Uh, you, you just think, how, how is it possible for this to survive? And, uh, and yet, it, it does happen. So, Lucian, where is that tree? Right now, on Mount Nebo in Arkansas. Mount Nebo in Arkansas is the location of the tree. We might, we might because we've, we've driven that a lot and you, when you said that I thought oh I've always wanted to go up that but yeah haven't done that so the lost history assignment I guess the question is is did you learn anything let me give you an example I've actually had someone who uh, and we used I used to do this as part of the evening and they would just, you know, start jotting things down. And I uh, noticed that this person stopped writing. And, of course, everyone else was still writing. And so I was, uh, you know, curious. And uh, so the question, did you learn anything, was, yeah, this is the first time I've ever lost anything or anybody. Well, no wonder, you know. So it's like, well, I didn't realize that that was true. And so the lost history basically just, just says, okay. That explains some things. It doesn't explain everything. It doesn't explain pain. But it might explain uh, whether something's hitting you particularly hard or whether something isn't and you wonder why. It, it could be something in the lost history that gives you some clues to that. So that's why it's not really an assignment. It's not something for us to put up on the board and analyze you, you know, because it's, it's for you to look at you and say, I didn't realize that. And I, I'm wondering if anybody had any aha that occurred. Okay. So the different ages was impressive. So does that mean this is all spread out all through life? It was, it was spread, uh, the, the earliest one when I was 39, the last one I was 75. 39 to 75, that's a pretty good range. And to have constant losses through... Uh, off, off and on through that period of time. That's, uh, yeah. Almost, almost half of your life, I guess it, it really. You know what hit me most of all? What's that? How fast 52 years <laughs> How fast, any uh, amount of time you say, wow, that's my birthday, how fast it went. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. But um, I'm, I'm barring ahead a little bit. But one of the things that we'll do tonight is talk about saying goodbye over a period of time. And so when, when I draw that and we get to the end and we, and we look back, that's one of the observations that a lot of times people make. They say, well, when I get there, I'm going to look back and say, well, this, you know, this year passed very fast. But that doesn't feel that way on a night when you're having trouble not crying or you're having trouble going to sleep. It's, it feels like it will never end. It will last forever. And that's, uh, that's a real, uh, real feeling. So I wrote on here, bunched up versus spread out. Um, 
we've talked a little bit about how our family feels like we've been hit a lot all at once right here. And one of the observations that I feel is I, I don't know that I've had time to process the first one. And sometimes it's the first one that makes me the most upset. And it's not because I've processed the others better, but it's because I really didn't process that one. And so it's the one that still hurts. Like when you step on it, it really hurts. Um, and it's very surprising. Um, as opposed to spread out, and I don't know if you would call yours spread out or not, but sometimes when they're spread out, you can kind of feel like, okay, I, I sort of got... You know, sort of got over the, sort of got over that as you go down the road of life. Not that you're over them, but that the pain of that loss isn't compounded in the second loss. It's like you can look at each of them individually and feel that loss, even though you have memories and things that go back. Um, it's not double whammy sometimes if it's spread out. Um, is you, as you look back at your loss history, can you point to a time where the people that were around just really didn't want to hear about it? They didn't want to see a display of emotion? Or was it, was it okay for you to feel what you felt? I mean, is that... That is... Uh, that's a big... That's a factor. That's, I'm listing these as factors. You can't process something if you're not allowed to feel it. Um, and the, the opposite of, of not being allowed to feel it is to be tricked into not feeling it. Uh, if you have a comic in the family that doesn't like to see tears and they're always going to tell a big joke or they're going to change the subject or they're going to bring up something stupid and ridiculous so that we don't ever process this, that's the same thing, only different. You know, you're not allowed to process the emotion because you're being interrupted when you try. And if someone is constantly uh, stopping you from displaying your emotions, you really need to find a way to say, it's okay this time. Um, I've had people say, uh, I, I want to come, come and see your mom, but I won't bring up anything about your dad. And I'm like, well, you may not, but she will. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck with that, you know. But, but the, it's like, I don't want to bring that up because that would be negative. I mean, well, yeah, it's negative, but I mean, it, it's, it happened, you know. You can't, you can't ignore it. Um, so we process it over time, and when someone else comes in and they're, uh, they're someone we're not around very often, but then they tell a story about how, what, what this person meant to them, well, that's very healing, usually. Um, yeah, there might be tears. That doesn't mean I got set back in my grief process. That means I got to process a little more of it. And that's, um, this display of emotions is a, is a big factor. And then, whether you have a support system or not, um, sometimes the losses are moves. So, you know, if yeah, we moved around, we were a military family, we moved around a lot, people say. Well, okay, so did you ever... You kept saying goodbye to those friends. Did you keep writing to them after you said goodbye to them? Or did you find that four or five moves later, you'd lost complete track of them? You know, social media has kind of given us a little lease on life there that we didn't used to have because we used to have to pick up the phone or write a letter and, and it either cost money or it cost time. And we just didn't really have that. Um, but, it, you know, moves can be as emotional and frequent moves certainly complicate death losses uh, particularly with children um, who lose a parent and now they've got to go live with an uncle in another state. Well, you know, they lost their home and their loved one and their friends. And what if uncle isn't quite as uh, appealing to live? I mean, you know, you can't exactly object. I mean, you're stuck. So uh, the mobility factor is, uh, is pretty, uh, pretty tough. Did you, anything you want to comment on about, as you look at your loss history, what's something you'd say you'd learn? Well, and that's a good, 
that's a good indication of, on the list when we talk about how close were you. Well, so it, you might you might have written those down as losses, but in this case she didn't because the, it's almost like she doesn't feel them as losses the way she feels these others as losses. And yet I know there were cross country moves in in her growing up, and then we made cross country moves more than once. So um, that the how close you were or how much it impacted you might have to do with whether it even gets on the list. The loss of a future you had envisioned that you would have and it didn't happen. And so that's still a loss. Loss of dreams and uh, opportunities. Absolutely. If you would go back a page to last lesson, uh, coping skills, I want to go back and just... I, I drew a couple of things on this that you might want to draw on yours. I, I let me, uh, let me, I'm sorry, it's at the bottom of the page. Um, what I have on coping skills, there's two boxes. And then up here it says shrinking or expanding, which is, is so not helpful, I forgot that this is what that meant. So let me tell you what that means. <laughs> here's, here's what you may or may not want to draw at the bottom. Just, just kind of two lines. And think of this as a road. How easy is it to get down the road? Well, it depends on how narrow it is. So if it's pretty narrow, I'm going to have a harder time getting down the road one end to the other. So it would be nice if someone would, would, would push on this and, and make it more like that wide. I would have more room on the road. So the shrinking and expanding, this list uh, changes in activity, substances, overwork. These are things that cause the road to be narrow. These are things that shrink your coping ability. Okay? This side... Uh, gratitude, courage, affection, joy, forgiveness, and then things like exercise, relaxation, diet, and good health. These are things that expand, but think of it this way. You're, you're bringing them to the road, and you're pushing, you're pushing the sides so that it's wider. This side that expands is a way of making your coping skills better. These are things that make it worse, the, the negatives. Um, and here's, and this is, might be what you'd want to write on here. You look at those lists of things, and there are things on there that happen to you, and there are things on there you can do. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that we control what we can. And a lot of those are on the right side. Our ability to control some things might be our ability, uh, for instance, to have a grateful heart. I can work on that. I can try to have a grateful heart, and that's going to expand my coping skills. It's going to give me a, a wider road to, to travel down. And I have some control over that. Now, control is a... Is a Keyword. Loss, <laughs> by definition, is a loss of control. I wanted to still be with this person. I don't have any control over that anymore. I can no longer be with this person. I'm not in control of that. I can't control the loss. But I could exercise and help, help myself broaden my ability to cope that's something I can control so I'm not I'm not only I'm, it's a double meaning to say control is is something we want to exercise when we can because the loss itself has taken it away from us if I if I exercise some control in my life I'm pushing back against the loss itself because the loss took that control away from me now how is it, how, how do we feel in the midst of this loss? Lots of energy and optimism and get up and go and ready to go start a new project. Is that how you feel? 
Not so much. So this is like asking the hardest thing ever because this is not how we feel. But remember, again, it's because the, the loss took the control away from us and it leaves us defeated. And so absolutely anything we're able to do is a pushback and a regaining of control and it will, it will baby step by baby step give you the, the want and the will and the motivation to begin to do other things. You, you have to see it uh, as a journey though, as a road. And, uh, and so, as you're going down the road and it's, and it's really long, you have periods where it's pretty, pretty thin and, and then you have a pretty good time and this is a good time. You know, you're able to do things pretty well, but you may return to a time when things are kind of, kind of tough again. Um, I, I'm trying to draw things because I, I want to always keep in front of you that this is a process, and it, and that how you feel now is not how you're going to feel. Back to your tree. The tree says, over time, life can return and things can bloom that, that you thought were completely gone, worthless, not able to, to, to thrive. Don't ever feel that your road has only one possibility because all of these are not only possible, but they're likely to be things that you will go through. It, it, it is going to be a process that changes often. In, in, uh, in time. Question about that? That makes a whole lot more sense, she says. Thank you. See, if, if you miss a key concept, the teacher is completely sidetracked. So, try not to do that again. I know that... <clears throat> Speaking of control, <laughs> one of the things we want to resist, going back to the pre uh, previous page under lost history, I sneaked it in on you. There's actually a diagram between the factors and the filters. <laughs> the filters is the, the brown colored part. In between that is, is a timeline. Now, theoretically... I'm on today's lesson, session three. I'm at the word loss, and that is defined by this first down. We've had a loss, and then I've got several goodbyes across there, if you, you see those and points on that. Over here at the other end is permission to stop. And what we're stopping is permission to stop grieving. <laughs> okay? Scoot over one more. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hidden, that word loss right there. I, I, really, I really want you to see, you know, three months, uh, two years, um, ten years. I'm not predicting how long it's going to take you to get to this place. I'm just saying I want you to see this as a long period of time, okay? And I, and I think that's one of the reasons that there's always someone who hears me explain the first week that what you want to do is to begin saying goodbye to the relationship as it was, which is a not very fun way of saying to something we used to do together, to something we shared. They're, they're, the two things that happens, we, we have a loss and then, and then we go down the road and we, we come to this place where we realize, oh, that loss means I lost this. 
I wasn't thinking about this when I went to the funeral. I was thinking about that loss. But this loss produces other losses. And, we, and it's not that it takes 10 years to figure that out, obviously, but, but that's why the first months are very intense because it's like every time we turn around, well, I didn't realize I lost that too. Well, well, of course, well, yeah, we can't do that anymore. Well, yeah, they're not here. So you're constantly realizing things you can't do. Does that sound like lack of control? <laughs> See, that, that's why control is a real definition almost of, of loss. What this diagram is meant to do is, is kind of turn that around. Instead of this being discoveries that you make, where it slaps you in the back of the head, which is usually how it feels, um, it's, it's saying, stand here at this road and look way, 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 way down the road and, and tell yourself, my life for a long time to come is going to be made up of a series of goodbyes. I'm going to find things that I lost, that I don't realize I've lost. As I find those, I simply want to acknowledge them. I'm not trying to have a funeral every time one happens. I'm not trying to, you know, make uh, a grand decision. Um, it is absolutely permissible, and this is one of the things I think I did try to say in the first night. It's absolutely per permissible to come to one of these places and say, I'm not ready to say goodbye to that yet. Well, of course. Because... What if you have all these right here? Are you ready to do all that right now? No, absolutely not. You can't, you can't say goodbye that much at the beginning and, and feel that you have anything left of you to go back to our, our circle. Remember our circle last week? If, if you had to say goodbye to all of that at the beginning, well, you just, I mean, devastation wouldn't even begin to cover what happened. But you can say no or you can say yes to saying goodbye, okay? And it might be that you experience something a few times. Uh, I, I've used an example, I think, last week that uh, the closet is still full of all of Dad's clothes. Every shoe, every shirt, every pair of pants, every set of overalls is still right exactly where he left it. The only thing that has changed is we washed what he was wearing and we put them away. That's all that changed. Now, I've walked by that closet often. And, and I've, I've actually thought about moving some things. <laughs> and, and I've done what I've said to you here. And this is, a very, this is a very simple illustration. This is not a highly emotional thing for me. But I've basically decided not to touch that closet for a while. Okay? I'm getting, now I've cleaned out some drawers, you know. I've moved some things. I've actually taken some things home. I've given some things away. I've thrown some things away. But at that point, I come to the place where I say, you know, this, this desk drawer is not going to be opened by him again. I'm not, I'm not offending him. I'm not stealing from him. These things don't count for that anymore. And so they can, they can go to wherever they go. And I'm going to say goodbye to this being his desk drawer. Does that, does that make sense in, intellectually? Now that's, again, I'm, I'm, that's, uh, that's not a highly emotional thing. Uh, you might find yourself coming to a place, uh, let's say a restaurant, a, uh, an anniversary spot. Um, some people deal with this with church. They come in and they sit down and it's just not the same. Well, of course it's not the same, you know. Um, there's there's going to be emotional things through here. And, I, and what I want you to see is that the time that you get here, and I want to tell a story about how this feels to kind of normalize that. The time that it takes to get here is made up of 
finally being willing to say goodbye several times. Okay? Now, let, let, me, let me put that timeline into a story about moving because that, that's an easier timeline. So you move and you have, and you know you're going to move. And so you have going away party and you have phone calls and people come over and they bring cake and, I, you know. You have all these things where you're saying goodbye, you're saying goodbye, you're saying goodbye, and then you finally get in the truck and you, and you pull off and you move. And then you write and you write and you write and you write and you're on social media every night and, you, and it's constant. And then you're not. And then you're not writing as much. And then you're sending a Christmas card once a year. Okay? And then you move again and, and you've got all those friends and now your time is kind of you know, kind of precious. It's difficult to write to this friend because you have this group of friends that are more fresh and recent and, and th that pain hurts. And so you, you get to the end of this road, the theoretical end of this road where you say, it's okay if I don't send a Christmas card this year to my original friend over here. We're still friends. I still remember them. But I'm but I have said goodbye a number of times, and I have gotten to the place where I can, I hate to use the word let go, because it doesn't apply as well, you know, in a relationship, like a spouse and that kind of thing. But fundamentally, if you think of it in terms of like moving away, that's what grieving can look like if you'll let the goodbyes occur um, say no to a bunch in the beginning because you, you don't want to have to process all this, but somewhere, at some level, with the closet or the box of shoes or the desk drawer, start saying goodbye to something. And when you do that, you'll find that it will be okay at some period of time later to say goodbye to something else. And you're saying... I'm not going to be able to share that experience with my loved one anymore. And I'm saying goodbye to ever being able to do that again. And then that might cause tears and, and a, a session of, of mild to severe grief, you know, as you do that. But it is, it is a step in the journey that gets you to the other end of the road. It's... It's an academic explanation of an emotional process. Does that make any more sense than it did two weeks ago? I do this intentionally because people are very resistant to this the first week, typically. Um, I've almost never had a class where someone didn't say, I'm just not ready to do that yet. And that's fine. That's fine. Of course you're not. And this is part of it. There's too many things to say goodbye to and there's the idea, I'm not letting go of anything of them yet. You know, I refuse. And that's, that's, that's grief. Yeah, that's what it feels like. That's fine. Uh, that's not unhealthy. That's just reality. And that's how it feels. Do you have any question about it? Some people would open a desk drawer and refuse to move anything. Yes. Yes. Talked about last week, one of our challenges is we open a desk drawer, we open a closet, and we, we, we decide we cannot bring ourselves to touch anything, and therefore we make a shrine. If someone else were to come in and, and try to touch anything, we would tell them they can't. No, you're not allowed to do that. Well, that might just be saying, no, I'm not ready to say goodbye to right. you. Right. And next year, or maybe even just next year, and it might be, I don't want you to do it. I don't want you to make it easy for me. I don't want you to clear this closet so I don't have to. I want to do it. It's, it's not that it's a shrine because I don't want to let anybody else touch it. That's, that's not necessarily negative either. It is simply I, control again. I want to take control and I want, I want to do it when I'm ready to do it on my terms in my way. And I, yes, I want to do it. I want to be the one who does it. And, you know, it's not wrong to say, would you please take all of their things out because I just can't bear to look at them anymore, you know? Some people do that. But they're going to grieve about other things. They're going to grieve about places, and they're going to grieve about the empty room or the closet, you know? That's going to hit. 
So it's not going to stop your grief to let someone else clean out the closet. It's not going to stop it. It's going to move it. Okay? I'm ready to look at filters. They're kind of on the theme of, of coping tonight. This is the brown box with all the slanted lines in it. Let me, uh, let me write it as if it were a funnel because you're more familiar with this. So if, if, if the diagram looked like this, then the top of it would, would just have these different categories in it, okay? So this is sort of what, we're, what I'm representing here. Um, what I did differently on your diagram is I said the foundation of your way of life is made up by what you process and let get through your filter. Um, and and the, the stuff we deal with in life is part of what defines who we are. The stuff we encounter is part of our, uh, our way of life. So what you have here is, is the great big arrow, which I don't have room to write here, that says incoming. This is how you feel maybe when the death occurs and the, the funeral home is on their way and the phone is ringing and you need to call Aunt Susie and you need to call the kids and you need to call the boss and, you need, and, and the phone is ringing and the texts are coming and it's, it's, just, it's just raining on you. And, and while these things, and some people feel this way about the funeral. I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. I got to go here. I got to go be there. I got to go meet in the room. We got to walk down the aisle. We got to sit in the chairs. We got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. And, they, and it's like, it's just constantly raining on them. And what does that sound like? Lack of control? Yeah. Okay. We're back there again. Um, the incoming, the, the only way to stop the rain is to get an umbrella. And you can't keep it from coming, but you can decide not to have to deal with it. And this is simply a representation of the way you might look at it. And, and in our representation, the biggest category is discard. One of the things we need to do is tell ourselves there is a lot of stuff that we are not going to be able to do. And that I give myself permission not to have to make all of these decisions. One of the things I'm struggling with right now is that there's always somebody that needs a decision out of me. And I am trying my best to push those decisions back you make that decision. You decide that and you figure that out. Because I, I simply cannot process that much. I can't, I can't emotionally process that much input. I, I, I might have been last year, but with these losses, I, I don't have the emotional energy to do it, for one thing. Plus, uh, I, I don't... I don't want everybody catering to me. I don't want them saying, well, let's just see what Matt wants to do because we're going to do whatever Matt wants to do. Nice. Go on about your life, you know. Uh, it's, don't, don't make it revolve around me. I need to discard probably a fair amount of what is coming my way just to, just to be able to, to process. But you see the other three categories before you get to, well, there's two. There's either something that's unimportant. Can you think of something unimportant? Maybe like whether we use uh, Verizon or T-Mobile. Is that really a decision that, that really needs to be made right now? Of course, that might make the middle category can wait. I'm, I'm not going to make a decision where I have to 
study all my options, make a clear decision, and then do something and carry it out because I'm really smart and I'm really wise and I'm doing the frugal thing or I'm doing the wise thing here. Some of those decisions can simply wait, but some of them really aren't even important. I might not discard them, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push them over. I'll get to them maybe in three weeks if I, if I feel like it. Um, they're just not important. So you, you're left with vital and top priority. And I can't define those things for you, but um, they might have to do with your job. They might have to do, certainly, with your loved ones that remain. Um, you, you don't want to injure or burn a bridge with those kind of things. They're top priority. And so those, those incomings are going to get a path. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work. I'm going to do those. I'm going to spend time with people. I'm going to uh, take an evening and cook out. Or I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. The vital stuff, you know, you, you got to mow the lawn. <laughs> it's, it's more urgent than vital, but, you know, vital is what it feels like when it's so thriving like it is, taking your yard over. Um, we didn't trim the rose bush this year, you know. Boy, we wanted to trim the rose bush. We've got a knockout rose that's, you know, it's about, it's, it's not far from its maximum height, but we wanted it to have fresh growth. We wanted it to start smaller, and we didn't get it done. Um, it's not that it really can wait because we really can't do it now unless we don't want to see any blooms from it. <laughs> we can't cut it down or there won't be any more blooms. So, uh, you know, you, you shove some things that, that's just not as important as. So, you know, you just, you don't make yourself go do all those things. And, and, it's, and seeing your life as a filter that has the ability to, to just channel the the priority stuff and the vital stuff and and give yourself a break on the rest ask for help so the, all those people that said if there's just anything i can do say yeah you can go mow my yard <laughs> yeah please would you trim my rose bush filters um I, what i wrote out to the side where it says filters is the word use whoops <laughs> Use filters. Make sure you use the ones that you want and, and don't, don't let stuff overwhelm you. Push it, push it away, shove it aside, say, not now, not me, uh, not whatever. Uh, just, I don't have to do that right now. Yeah, and give yourself permission. Someone called me 15 minutes before we started tonight and uh, they called me last week, uh, probably on Wednesday, because I was busy that night, too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you didn't call me. Well, you know, normally I would have said, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I should, you know, I just say, you know what, I, I, I just can't right now. I, I, this is, I'm noticing this is something I'm not doing very well. I'm not returning calls very well. And, I, I, you know, and I am sorry, but, but, I, but I want you to understand I have no intention of really dealing with that right now. I don't know that I can. I really will call you when I can. And we talk for 15 minutes or so. But it, uh, it, it's a filter. And, and, and part of the filter is not taking the guilt or the blame or thinking, well, my life will just completely unravel if I don't take care of business. Well, what I've learned is yes and no. The rose may need to be trimmed good next year. Uh, and I'll remember it most of the year, but, but you know that rascal's blooming anyway. So, you know, what can you say? It's, it's okay. It's all right. Questions about that? Well, I crammed it all on one page today. I shouldn't have done that. I got it so small you couldn't even see what the say goodbye timeline was. There's actually two more things left. And the one simply has the word progress with it. I'm going to draw another timeline. 
But now, instead of talking about coping skills, we're not talking about the quality of how we're dealing with things. We're talking about whether we're getting down the road or not. Now, typically, we think of life as, you know, as being kind of like steps. And progress would be, you know, get from this level to that level. And, and you know, in the days when I would talk about stages of grief, I'd put a word on all those. And I'm really trying not to do that anymore. When you've had a loss, remember I said there's all those things about goodbye. And I, when we talked about how, how do you do grief, and it's like a scatter gun or scatter plot that, that comes in random order. Well, progress is like that a little bit too. Um, you, you make progress, but it's not so much a step. And, and yeah, you have kind of a setback, and, and, and you might have this kind of progress, and theoretically you're kind of getting up. But if you looked at the bottom, you'd question that a little bit. You know, it's probably not a great time to, to give a whole lot of analysis to the, uh, to the progress. In a matter of months, these will feel a little less like popcorn and a little more like this. Um, like you'll have longer, longer stretches. Um, you'll go five days without having a really hard, surprising, gut-wrenching cry. <laughs> and you think, five days? What? You know, that's, that's longer than the first week. The first week wasn't that way. I didn't, I didn't make it uh, that far. But you'll just see some milestones. You'll see some things happening. You'll go all day at work, and yes, you'll, uh, you'll, uh, you'll notice the loss, you'll feel the loss, but it won't, it won't debilitate you. I don't need to hear that. Well, mine's spam risk, so. Oh, lost my cap. No, that's the next topic. Okay. Okay. So I'm just saying, where it says progress, I drew, I drew a line across there that fundamentally it's squiggly at first and, it's, and it begins to stretch out a little more, is all we're saying. As, as time goes by, this is why people say time heals wounds. And I am not saying that. I'm saying that as you say goodbye to the relationship as it was, as you um, cry and, and grieve and feel the loss and remember something you're grateful for that, that you will always remember, you know, those are the things that really heal the heart. It isn't time at all. It's just that those things take time. Um, and it's, it's a nice summary of things to say time heals all wounds. But progress... Some of these things happen to us and some of these can be intentional steps that we take. And we're going to spend some time next week uh, being more specific about those intentional steps that we can take. Okay, the triangles uh, is a different thing. And it's really, this one is um, a little more how, how things look. This is fairly stable. Um, you got a good base. You, you can't blow that over easily. Uh, this, the, that's what the first triangle represents. But, but the arrow coming against it is the, the force of, of loss or, uh, or other life things. And what can happen is your triangle can get upended and there can be more than one set of things that makes you feel like you're tumbling you don't this is this is loss of control
just like if you were on a tightrope over the Grand Canyon and, and you were losing your balance, you'd say, I'm losing control. <laughs> Maybe more than that, who knows. Stable feels one way, this feels completely different. And what you're, what you're trying to do is, is get back planted on the ground. That's, this, is, this is a representation of, of what happens to you. And so I, I wanted to end tonight with CPR because uh, these three words, communication, for the C, communication is something that will cause things to be right again. Um, I'll give, you, I'll give you a particular example. Obviously, communication could be encouragement, uh, beautiful cards, a, a little call that says, I'm thinking about you. Those are, those are all wonderful, um, healing, caring things. But what I'm actually pushing us toward here is the kind of communication where we begin the process of getting to know someone. And I'm using that a little bit like an example. If you wanted to get to know someone, how would you communicate? Would you say a fact about yourself and say, see you next week? And then give another fact about yourself and say, next week I want to hear one from you. Is that communication? No. I, I'm using get to know as this needs to be two-way and it needs to happen. What I want to encourage you to do, this is actually pulling all three together. I want to encourage you to try to initiate more of a two-way communication, not just a, someone being nice to you, but but one where you're talking or asking questions back. This is, uh, relationship is the third one. This is really relating with someone. And one of the things that makes loss of control begin to feel normal again is, is when you feel like having a conversation again. And I know that sometimes we start a conversation and then, we, and then we're upset and, and we feel like, well, I don't know, maybe I wasn't ready to have that conversation yet, you know. Um, but the CPR here is, this, this is one of the things we can do tangibly about getting down that path we were looking at a minute ago. Trying to have communication with people. You, you can initiate it as simply as in the store, being outgoing with someone that is, that is serving you. That's also two-way. You know, acknowledging them because they did this for you is two-way communication. And if you do it that often, like every time you were to go somewhere and you found something that you could compliment or you found something that you could notice about someone else and you brightened their day a little bit and they gave you a smile back, those kind of things are really, they're really elixir for the soul. And communication is uh, the first. Participation is the P. And uh, what I want you to think is not withdraw. Now, once again, like saying goodbye, am I saying that the next time someone asks you to do something, you should say, oh yeah, I need to do that because Matt said I needed to participate. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you don't feel like it, don't. But I'm saying at some point, realize that participating in something is CPR for getting this feeling back. And I do think church is one of those things. Yes, the first time is going to be hard. It will be hard if you wait six months. 
So you can wait six months and have your hard day and lose out on six months of encouragement and participation and communication. I really believe if, if we would find something that normalizes life, something that we have done, that we enjoy doing, that we want to do, even if it's painful to do, that the participation and the, and the decision not to withdraw all the way on, on that piece is, is CPR for us to get, to get the well-being back. Um, this could be family things. Uh, it could be a club or schooling or, you know, I, I don't... I don't know that uh, jumping into a semester of college, you know, the week after the funeral is probably not going to be something you do. You might say, you know, I'm going to take a, a little time off. But that sort of thing, or taking a little class, taking a four-week grief class is participation. See, so you, you've, you've pushed yourself out there a little bit, and this, this really is part of the CPR. And so the last one is relationships, and it kind of pulls it together. But there's something unique here that um, I'm going to put in large your circle. And, I, and when I came to this, I remembered a, a promise that we made to someone who lost someone not long after we did. Pretty immediately, really. We said, we need to get together and... Uh, we need to swap stories about the person we lost. Okay. The enlarge the circle part is, this is a person that I've not done that with. So this, initiating that very action would enlarge our circle, would enlarge my circle or her circle. Um, that's important because what we've experienced is a loss. Now, on one hand, I have this big loss and I think, oh, I just can't think about anything but this person I lost. Well, yeah, that's, that's pretty normal. Um, and, I, well, I don't want to make room for someone else in my life because, you know, really all I can think about is this person I lost. Well, what I'm saying is that's feeling right here, and feeling right here is that place where you say, you know, I used to spend every night of the week <laughs> at home with this person, and I actually could take a night and I could go be with somebody and enlarge my circle and uh, not really create a new relationship necessarily, although that's certainly fine. But I'm, And I'm just talking about a communication relationship, okay? But relationships is relating, relating two-way Mutual, I share my story, you share your story, I'm going to share a little more of mine, you share a little more of yours. It's not me talking and you listening. And, and if you can try not to do that, people will stay around a whole lot better. Um, if we're communicating and it's a two-way street, it, if we're relating, if we're bowling, if we're watching a movie, if we're playing cards, if we're... Um, sitting over a cup of coffee at a coffee shop or in my living room or whatever. Um, relationships make loss and the loss of control over, I don't have this person. This starts to feel normal. <clears throat> Doesn't replace a spouse. <laughs> you, you understand how astronomically different that is. But this is big. Just the relating is really big. It's, it's, the, it's the CPR that we need to kind of get us down the road a little bit and feeling a little more normal. And that's why tonight I've been off the tipping point where I just, I, I can't figure out which way I'm going to go, you know, here because of the loss. It's just been so devastating. So we've talked about coping tonight. This is like, it's a little less, do this, do this, do this, but it's more like, here's what it sort of looks like. And, uh, and I, I, want you to, I want you to take an assignment tonight, and that is to do something good for yourself.
Um, start something you've always wanted to start. Buy something you've always wanted to buy. Uh, give away something you've always wanted to get rid of. Um, clean out the drawer. I don't know. Do something that when you get through, you go, okay, that feels better. And, and I mean, for yourself. Um, because that's a way that any one of these things that we've <laughs> kind of given you all this input about, well, you'll, you'll find a way to use one of those things if you do something good for yourself. Okay? It, will, it will be a tangible way of carrying out one of these principles that we, uh, that we talked about. <clears throat> and that's what I had to share tonight. Um, we're going to talk about loneliness next week. And more specifically, some things that can be done. Uh, I'm going to use the word community next week. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll return to some of these thoughts. But um, I'm, uh, I'm convinced that loneliness is the, one of the major pains of the grief. And obviously... We have a desire to fix it. And one of the biggest mistakes we could make would be to fix it so that we're not ever lonely again and create a whole new, like, run to Vegas and get married, you know. Probably not, you know. Um, loneliness is something sort of like the grief process that takes time, but it really is a good thing for us because it makes us do some things. That, uh, that we need to do. And so we're going we're gonna to focus on loneliness before we wrap up in this. All right? Well, appreciate you coming again tonight. And wow, thanks for sharing the picture your father painted of a tree that, if I went to look at it now, would look nothing like this. <laughs> So what a it'd be still twisted. The experience still happened, but but life got better. Thank you.